Infrastructure projects typically involve roadways, highways, electricity generation, irrigation projects, communication, etc. Traditionally, these have been funded by either the government or by large corporations. In other words, there has been almost no direct investment from the general public and the only way to invest in this sector was by either purchasing shares in an infrastructure company or by investing through a mutual fund. But now there is a third option and this comes in the form of infrastructure investment trusts or INVITs. INVITs are new to the country and therefore this topic might be a bit new and fun to understand for most investors. So in this video, we shall detail out what are INVITs, how are they structured, how INVITs generate returns for investors, the taxation rules and whether these investment trusts are worth investing in. Let's begin. Let's assume we have an infrastructure company which constructs a bridge at the cost of a thousand crores. This bridge is rather crucial for the region and cuts down traveling time for trucks by over 10 hours. And for this service, the government allows the company to collect a toll of 50 rupees per trip from every truck that passes through. Now this thousand crores is the tough part and that's because it's difficult for many companies to put up such high sums of money and probably that's why most companies end up borrowing this money which adds a layer of unwanted complexity to their balance sheet. Anyways, let's say things move ahead, this company borrows the money, constructs the bridge and is now expecting 50 rupees per trip which means it's going to take many, many years before the company recoups the capital, pays off the loan and makes some profit out of this project. And this is where an infrastructure investment trust comes in. Technically, INVITs are trusts that are sponsored by infrastructure developers that own, operate and invest in completed as well as under construction infrastructure projects. So that's the technical definition. But more importantly, these INVITs also double up as a financial instrument that allows these entities to issue units to retail investors a lot like how shares are allotted. So if we go back to our illustration, what this means is that our infra company can now sponsor and set up an INVIT and issue units to investors at an initial NAV which then becomes tradable in the stock market. For instance, say the bridge project is valued at 1000 crores. Now the INVIT can break this up into 10 crore units of 100 rupees each and can then invite the general public to participate in its IPO. This way the infrastructure company or developer gets back some of the 1000 crores that had been invested and this money can then be utilized for other projects. It also helps that forming a trust under the Indian tax laws offers a number of tax benefits that are not available to corporations which is then likely to increase the post-tax revenue of the infrastructure company. And then there is the economic argument wherein this recyclability of capital is a big boost for infrastructure companies which can then pave the way for more infra projects. While an invit might operate as a stock, the construct of an invit is a lot like a mutual fund. In fact, it won't be wrong to state that the SEBI has ripped out many parts of the MF playbook to create the INVIT regulations. After all, INVITs and mutual funds allow multiple investors to pull in their investments. Both instruments have assets managed by a designated manager and both follow a three-tiered management structure consisting of a sponsor, a trustee and a manager. I won't go into the details of this video, but if you want a better understanding of these constituents, then do check out a couple of resources, a blog post by ET Money and the 2014 SEBI regulations on INVITS. The links of both these are available in the description of this video. Now there are some parts of the SEBI regulation that we found particularly interesting. For instance, INVITS are allowed in five main heads, which can be broadly classified as energy, transport and logistics, communication, social and commercial infrastructure, and water and sanitation. From a funding perspective, INVITs have the options to be publicly listed or privately held, which gives a lot more flexibility to these investment trusts. And as it stands, there are more privately managed INVITs as compared to the publicly traded ones. 
but one trusted investment platform that prides itself in sharing all its content with the public and that too free of cost is none other than ET Money. So if you haven't done that yet, then do download the ET Money app and access the learn section there where we post our best blogs and videos to keep your learning engine moving. And if you find something invest worthy, then do use the app to invest in thousands of zero commission direct mutual funds that we have on our platform. And Invit earns revenue by operating one or many infrastructure projects. In a previous illustration, we explained the workings of a bridge company that would charge a toll of 50 rupees per trip. And it is this cash, this income, which is available for distribution to the Invit unit holders. Actually, it is not this income, not this 50 rupees in its entirety that is available for distribution, but rather it is the net income, which means income after deducting expenses like depreciation, maintenance, cost of operations, etc. This remaining balance is formally called net distributable cash flow or NDCF. To bring more clarity to this, let's examine the NDCF of IRB Invit Limited, which was India's first publicly listed Invit. The data here pertains to the financial year 2020, and notice here that the trust has received over 7,800 crores of inflows, and after accounting for the outflows, the distributable cash flow is a little over 6,000 crores. Now, as per the SEBI regulations, the trust is required to mandatorily distribute at least 90% of the NDCF to the unit holders, which means at least 90% of the 6,068 crores needs to be distributed to the unit holders. Which takes us to the next question, which is how is this money going to be distributed? And for this, the Invit has a few options. Option one is where it can distribute the money as dividends. Option two is to distribute it as interest, which will then be received net of withholding taxes. And the third way in which Invits distribute the cash flow is through the buyback of units, which is also called return of capital. Each of these options have some taxation implications, which we shall discuss a little later in this video. So in the case of IRB Invit Limited, the trust has been distributing the NDCF using two of the three methods. A, it has been paying an interest, which is generally done once every three months, and B, it has been returning some of the capital. In fact, the data here shows how the trust has been apportioning between the two modes, the annual interest payout ranging from 6.5 to 8.85 rupees, and the return of capital apportionment being between 2 and 3.4 rupees per unit. So the combination of dividend, interest, and capital reduction explains the first part of how an investor makes returns through an invit. The other way unit holders make money from invits is by way of capital gains. After all, a lot like equity shares, the price of invit units change by the minute depending on many factors like expected cash flow, interest rates, yields, and of course, the perceived performance of the trust which means investing in an invit requires the same amount of rigor that one would use to evaluate the share price of any company. So if you're keen on investing in an invit, then a good place to start would be to access the information on projects, historical returns, concession periods, etc., all of which are available in the company's annual reports, earnings calls, and corporate presentations. The taxation rules for invits are a bit complicated, so do consult a tax advisor who will be in a better position to explain the nuances related to invit taxation. But here's what we did learn. Firstly, the returns in the form of interest are taxable and it's taxed as per your income tax lab. The second form of returns are dividends and in this case, the taxation depends on whether the invit took some tax concession from the government, because if it did, then as per the present law, any dividends passed on to investors are taxable and shall be taxed as per the individual's income tax lab. However, if the invit did not take the concessional tax rate and paid the entire tax on the project, then in that case, the investor will not be required to pay any taxes on the dividend received. And that's what makes taxation an important thing to figure out 
even before you make an investment in an invit, as different invits might have different tax treatments. And finally, the third component that needs to be understood is the taxation on capital gains. Here too, there is a small complication. Now we're all familiar with the fact that taxes on capital gains are applicable only if you sell your units. The time cutoff for capital gains in case of invits is a lot like how it is done with debt funds. So if you sell your units at a profit within 36 months, then short term capital gains are applied. And if you sell it over 36 months, then it's the long term capital gains. But what is different here is that while this 36 month cutoff is similar to debt funds, the rate of tax is actually similar to what we see in equity funds, which means in case of invits, the short term capital gain tax rate is 15% and the long term capital gain tax rate is 10% for any amount exceeding 1 lakh rupees. Like every financial product, invits too have some advantages and shortcomings. In our view, there are four key benefits that invits offer. One, they are a wonderful diversification tool in a completely new asset class. Two, invits offer regular income in the form of dividends and interest payout. Point three, the assets, that is the infrastructure projects are professionally managed. And finally, the units are tradable and hence have the potential to be sold at a profit. Now, having laid out these benefits, invits also come with some limitations. And the primary problem is that the cash flows can be really unpredictable at times. For example, the IRB invit faced heavy disruption in its income last year due to a major dip in the road traffic. Invits often face temporary disruptions like a natural calamity or protests or accidents, but some disruptions can be more permanent in nature, like a tariff or a policy change, which can have a big impact on the invits income. A second concern with invits are its limited choices. At the time of recording this video, there were a total of 15 SEBI registered invits in India, out of which only three were publicly listed. So there aren't many options at the moment, which also brings forth the problem of low liquidity that investors might face when trading these units. A third concern is that there are no invit dedicated mutual funds in the country, which again brings us back to the question of should one invest in invits? Now we have debated this question multiple times within our team, and that's because all the pre-work, including the research, needs to be done by the investor and he or she cannot rely on the services of a professional fund manager. Just to give you a flair of why research might be important here, we went back to the IRB Invit Limited information and collected some data that might be worth discussing. So IRB Invit Limited operates and collects toll from seven road projects that they have in their portfolio. Now every project is different and hence it is all the more important to ask the right questions and seek the right answers here. For instance, I would really want to know how many more years is the SPV authorized to collect toll from these projects. After all, the toll represents income for the invit and it's in our interest to know if the income will roll in for just one more year or for the next five years or 20 years, etc. The table you see on your screen now displays this very information. Do notice that the concession period of two out of the seven projects is expiring in the very next year. That's the IDAA Infrastructure Limited and the Surat Dahisar Tollway Limited. And then there is another project whose concession period expires five years from now in the year 2026. Now, in addition to the concession period, it is also worthy to note that the Surat Dahisar Tollway contributes 45% of the toll collected, which is again a major, major valuation criteria. So these are some of the material facts that an investor needs to discover and analyze to get an accurate picture of the invits cash flows. And I hope all you viewers can now appreciate the quandary that our team and I are facing in evaluating the investability of invits. So here's where our thoughts are presently leaning. Evaluating invits is difficult for everyday investors. There are too few invits to choose from and the taxation is a bit complicated and might be on the higher side. 
So in our opinion, everyday investors should keep away from this asset class until this market matures. But having said this, if you love experimenting and are keen to put your research cap on, then do visit the description page of this video where we have attached some useful literature that will elevate your understanding of invits. And with this, we come to the end of this video. Don't forget to subscribe to the ET Money channel and share this video over Facebook and WhatsApp with your friends and colleagues. Thank you for watching and I look forward to catching up with you next week with another insightful video. Until then. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme related documents carefully.